All right. Which this? Okay, I'm good here. Okay, just checking. It is great to be with you all. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks to, to Trey and the whole family. Uh, it's pecan, right? Oh, look, she looked at me like the young lady here in the second row. She's like, "You better say that right. <laughs> don't don't mess that up." Now we got something for you if you mess it up. Uh, it is an honor to be here to be with you all. Um, man, I, I love uh, each opportunity that we get to come to a different space and place. We get to hear the stories uh, that you all have about how you've come into contact with Just Thinking, uh, what it's meant to you in your specific spaces and places as you uh, engage culture uh, and uh, how it's helped you, how it's benefited you. And both Daryl and I are incredibly grateful and really, truth be told, a little overwhelmed. Uh, for the mere fact that I think when, when we started Just Thinking, we never had a thought process of, of, of having the impact or footprint or exposure that we've had uh, with Just Thinking. But we've been, we've been thankful to God for uh, how he's used it and how people have benefited uh, and continue to benefit. Every time I come to one of these events and I get to hear Daryl uh, speak, uh, and and, and as, as I prepare, it's, it's an education process all over again. It, it really charges new ideas and new thoughts. And so uh, you all just sat under a, a, a professorial uh, seminary course, if you will, the last uh, hour and a half or so. And uh, you, I would encourage you, and I do this every time I, anytime I follow Daryl, I'm going to encourage you. I know that the, that the folks here at the church have, uh, have this recorded uh, like our podcast, we, we, Daryl said it earlier, we come fully loaded. Uh, our thought is if, you, if someone is going to fly us out, pay money to get us here, uh, we're not going to scrimp on, on what we deliver. We want to pack in all of the rich content that we have about the subject matter we're asked to cover uh, and to come and deliver it uh, in a way that's incredibly helpful. However, for the audience member, it can be overwhelming. Uh, this is not your powder puff preaching sermon. This is more of a lecture, uh, and I know you all don't get powder puff sermons here. Uh, I know your past. I know your pastor delivers rich word here, and uh, and so uh, this is one of those situations where we really un unpack quite a bit. So I'm going to encourage you with that uh, to go back and listen to uh, the recordings of these. You're, some of this you're going to capture notes uh, relatively quickly. Some of it you'll miss. Uh, whatever you miss will be there recorded for you. And so I'm going to just encourage you to go back through what Daryl unpacked in that brief uh, spectrum of time, considering the groundwork he covered, uh, was absolutely breathtaking. And so uh, I want you all to a, appreciate what you, what you experienced and were exposed to, but also to encourage you to go back and, and listen to it. I don't know that there'll be one space where you'll be able to capture as much ground as he covered. I don't, how many citations, Daryl, did you have in that particular message? Yeah, 26 citations uh, from uh, the, the, the crits themselves, from critical race theorists themselves. So he did a fantastic job of kind of providing you uh, with the origins of, of critical theory and critical race theory. And again, if you're unfamiliar, let me just stop here and ask, how many of you are, are, are regular listeners or listeners at least to the Just Thinking podcast? Raise your hand. Okay, most of you. Let me do this. How many of you have never heard of Just Thinking? Okay, not, not that many of you. Okay, yes. somebody's embarrassed in the back to raise their hand. But, well, if Daryl mentioned it before. Yeah. <laughs> security, security. Uh, uh, <laughs> we've dedicated six hours at least to kind of unpacking some of the origins of critical race theory. We've done other issues. We've, we've done other side issues, but focused on critical uh, race theory theory itself. We've got six hours of dedicated information. Uh, time won't permit me to unpack all of that here, but I, I want us to consider some things in particular. I'm going to lay out for you the groundwork that we're going to cover so that you'll be clear. Daryl just, I mean, just took you through a, just a, a volume full of information. I'm going to slow it down a bit, and I'm going to spread it out a bit. So while Daryl gave you more of the ideological framework, uh, he gave you the political, the social, cultural framework, uh, the origins of critical theory, uh, the origins of critical race theory. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take you down 50,000 feet into the practical level of where we live, how this this ideology now gets applied to us and really begins to kick down the doors 
of the church. This is, the, the, the transition is critical to understand. Uh, it's critical to understand the foundation that was laid prior to this ideology showing up, and I'll, and I'll cover that some with the social gospel. But it's also important for us to, to understand how did this invade, how did this godless ideology invade Christian culture? What took place that, what, was the, what, what caused that to even happen? Uh, how is it that my, my, uh, my saved father, mother, my saved family member uh, sees Black Lives Matter and all of a sudden now they're, they're, they're sucked into this, this ideology? And now it's, it's Thanksgiving, it's Christmas, and I've got to see them and deal with them. And what am I, what am I to say? Like, if the issue comes up, what are we going to have to deal with? How, how are we going to talk? How are we going to interact? And what does that look like? We're going we're gonna to cover some of that groundwork. Let me jump into my prepared notes. As believers, we understand the distinction between being in the world and not of the world. As believers in Christ, we're called out of the world and into the beautiful light of Christ. As we've watched the church, uh, particularly through this lens uh, that, we're, that we're encountering um, over the last two years, it's actually been relatively puzzling uh, to see so many in evangelicalism, those who are professed believers in Christ adopt the ideologies of the world, P particularly as it pertains to, as I mentioned, the full embrace or at least partial embrace of the idea known as critical race theory. We, th we see this in far too many of our nation's pulpits. The Apostle Paul in his admonition to the church at Ephesus explained that, that the purpose of the pastor and teacher is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. And, and he, he tells us why. He says, that so that they may no longer be tossed to and fro uh, by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4.14. 4, but what are we witnessing? What we're witnessing are pastors and teachers who have abdicated their responsibility with regard to equipping the saints for the works of ministry. They've been providing us with, with powder puff TED Talks from a standpoint of what we need to understand biblically. And there's been a, there's been a, a lack of real biblical clarity and biblical exposition. And, and what happens as a result? Well, we shouldn't be surprised that believers are tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine that comes across the landscape. However, before I jump into that with great depth, I want to really reiterate something that Daryl uh, spoke about. He gave toward the end, and you may have missed it, he gave five reasons why CRT is unbiblical. Five reasons why CRT is unbiblical. You may or may not have captured them. I'm going to revisit those just briefly because I want to, I want to reiterate those because I think they're important for you to consider. He said the five reasons, uh, critical race theory is unbiblical for at least the following five reasons. One, it categorizes image bearers of God into groups, into groups to cause division and antagonistic class struggle. The whole purpose of, of, the, of the idea of critical race theory is, is to divide you, not as, not as image bearers, being, being all of us are image bearers of God under that umbrella, but, but no, you, you're a part of segregated uh, areas. They, you're part of this, this intersectional coalition of victims, and that you need to identify with your, inter, in, in, with your intersectional uh, class a victimhood status for the purpose of overthrowing culture. So its whole purpose and intent is to, is to uh, cause division and to create an antagonistic class struggle. He cited Genesis 127. He cited Genesis 5.2. Uh, he cited Titus 3.10 through 11. The second thing he said is it imparts sinful motives, sinful motives to certain image bearers of God solely on the basis of, their co of the color of their skin. It imparts sinful motives to certain, image, certain of God's image bearers solely on the basis of the color of their skin. I mean, th this should be wrong on its face, but unfortunately, because of, because, of, because of the narrative of historic racism, we get blinded by that. Uh, we, we, we become sentimental about that storyline and as a result, we, we, we kind of drink down this idea that we're all, we're all guilty by association, not from a standpoint of, of what, a, what, a, what our federal head Adam did, but on the basis of something like skin color, and that that's uniquely different to each one of us as it's applied. Three, that it transfers guilt and presumed sins to those uh, of past generations, to those of present generations. He called this sin by proxy. He cited Ezekiel uh, 1820. 
in the second one, I missed the, I missed the, uh, the, the uh, scripture verse on that one. Number two, it was Acts 17, 26. And in that, Paul is, is, is explaining the fact that, that from, from God, God created one man, and from that man, we get multiple ethnicities. Number four, it is rooted in the sin of ethnic partiality, rooted in the sin of ethnic partiality. He cited James 2, 9. And then number five, it promotes materialistic covetousness and envy under the guise of justice and equity. And he cited Exodus 20, verses 17, Ezekiel 18, 20, John 6, 27, and 1 John 2, 9 through 11. So I wanted to reiterate those things because if you go back and listen to the recording of this, I want you to capture that. Why? Because for you as believers in Christ, you have to have a bullet in your gun, right? You have to have something to arm yourself with so that you know how to engage culture, biblically speaking, as to why you stand against this godless ideology, okay? Secondarily, I want to I encourage you to take a look at a statement that was written, and it actually is posted online. It was a statement written. In fact, I think Daryl was one of the writers uh, of this. He's one of the guys who, who was consulted uh, with this particular thing. It's called The Statement on Social Justice. The Statement on Social Justice. You can go to the thestatementonsocialjustice.com and identify it. Uh, the the, the um, president, uh, founder and president of G3 Ministries, Dr. Josh Bice, who, I'm, uh, who I work for, was one of the organizers uh, of, of the men who got together, gathered as they began in late 2017, early 2018, began seeing this social justice movement take place, uh, got together with a number of people, uh, with jo Dr. John MacArthur, with Tom Askell and others, got into a room and began to craft a statement that really is helpful uh, for you to explain the biblical foundation of what you believe regarding race, ethnicity, culture, society, and the like. So I want to encourage you to take some time, go through that. If you're, if you're a school teacher, if you're a, if you're a homeschool mom, I, I believe that document should be something. In fact, one, uh, one of the things I really want to, I want to urge is, as, as, in the role that I have there at G3, is that we take that statement and leverage it for, uh, for, for, for training and for teaching, uh, especially homeschoolers uh, who are being bombarded in culture with uh, issues around critical theory and critical race theory. So statement on social justice, the statement, or rather statement on social justice.com, statement on social justice.com. Um, now, those two things I want to encourage you to do. Take a look at those five uh, uh, statements, those five reasons why CRT is unbiblical, and to the statement on social justice.com. In our time together, and I've got a limited amount of time, so you're going to have to listen quickly. Now, Pastor Trey, it said, hey, you can take as much time as you want. I, I don't intend to do that. Uh, I intend to make sure that I stay within, within a certain amount of time because I realize I'm pushing up against lunch. And so I don't want to be the reason why your, your stomach is growling and the like. But I do have a lot of ground to cover. So let me lay out for you what I'm going to cover in our time together. Number one, we're, I, wanna, I want you to understand the interconnectedness of these three things, the interconnectedness of three things, the social gospel, liberation theology, and black liberation theology to CRT. So I want you to understand the interconnectedness of the social gospel, liberation theology, and black liberation theology to CRT. Now I want to tell you something. I could spend an entire day unpacking that alone, okay? But we're going to cover some more ground. Second thing I want to do is I want to I compare and contrast the civil rights movement, which had its primary genesis in the so-called black church. I say, there's a reason I say so-called black church, uh, with today's current social justice movement, okay? I want to compare and contrast the civil rights movement with today's social justice movement. So we're going to look at civil rights, social justice. How do they, how do they stack up? What does that look like? And then finally, I want to explain how and when these movements entered evangelicalism. So these are three things I'm going to cover. I actually cover these whenever I go somewhere. I, I, I cover these in three different talks. So you all are getting three talks combined and compressed 
into one talk. So I want you to listen closely because we've got a lot of ground to cover. As Daryl explained in his talk, the ideologies of CT and CRT are not new. These ideas have taken on a variety of forms in history. The question that must be asked is how do how these foreign ideas entered their way into evangelical circles? For many, it's a bit of a mystery. And as Daryl explained, much of what we face today actually stems from, he, he explained it as cultural Marxism. He explained that, that, that that's, what we see, that's what we're seeing today. And the same, this is the same cultural Marxism that was instituted by men like Max Horkheimer. That might be the first time you ever heard of that name. He was a German philosopher and a sociologist who actually gave us the Frankfurt School. He applied critical theory on a larger scale. Rather than it simply being an idea economically speaking, he was the one who, who crafted this idea of, of invading every facet of society and culture and looking at, at, at groups of people, segmented groups, the, 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 the haves and the have-nots, if you will, those who were oppressed and oppressor groups, if you will. It wasn't simply the, the, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, who, those who had money and those who hasn't. He wanted it to, to infiltrate every facet of of, of the cultural experience, which is why we, again, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's why we get the lens today why, where in our current culture and time we're seeing everyone say everything is, is white supremacy. Why? What you're hearing in that language is this Marxism being applied to every facet of culture uh, from a standpoint of ethnicity. Oh, that's, that's white supremacy. That's the language that's being used. Daryl also explained how, this, how, how the influence of these men uh, had impact on every facet of culture. Like I said, he, he had you know, all those citations, all those names. If, if you, if, if you want to leave here and really get educated, uh, I would encourage you to go back and listen to what's been recorded. The names of the people that, that have been uh, unpacked in, in, the, in the space and time that you've sat here would give you every framework that you need uh, to be incredibly equipped to dialogue with anybody about the subject matter. Now, as vital as it is to trace the origins of the ideological framework that brought us critical theory, I think it's equally important for us to understand how this worldview entered into religious circles, taking on a theological framework in doing so. This is where, in my estimation, the most dangerous transition was not simply that these ideologies had, uh, were godless uh, and, and, and had, had impact, right? Why? Because it met people where they lived. The, the, the ideology said, hey, you have something and someone else doesn't have it. Doesn't that make you upset? Shouldn't you look at them as, as, as someone who's oppressed you as a result? Now, so of, of, of all the situations and circumstances that have taken place, the fact that they have something and the fact that you don't should cause you to want to rise up and overthrow. Right? It, it appeals to that visceral kind of envy that we have that's a part of, that, that is a natural part of human nature. But I think what's additionally problematic is when that framework begins to take on a theological lens, when it begins to adopt theological language in an effort to promote its ideas. So you see, when you combine godless ideologies, Marxism and critical theory, with religious fervor of men like Walter Rauschenbusch and his social gospel in the early 1900s, you mix that with the liberation theology and black liberation theology of the 1960s and 70s with men like James Cone uh, and, and uh, Gustavo Gutierrez. Uh, what you have in, in that mix, what you're currently facing with critical race theory within evangelicalism. I'll explain a little bit deeper. So let me back up and give you context. Known as the father of the social gospel, Walter Rauschenbusch. I'll spell this for those of you who are taking notes. Walter Rauschenbusch is spelled R-A-U-S-C-H-E-N-B-U-S-C-H. One more time, R-A-U-S-C-H-E-N-B-U-S-C-H. Walter Rauschenbusch is a pastor and theologian in the early 1900s. Now, now his time period predates critical theory. But what he does is, is appeal to something in human nature of, of those who have and those who don't, those who uh, are, 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 are less fortunate to those who are. And that framework begins to pervade the culture within America long before critical theory shows up on the shores of the Americas. And again, that's what I'm trying to show you with the theological framework that took place long before this ideology shows up and they, they collide and meet at the point at which 
uh, CT actually shows up on the scene. Rauschenbusch was born in Rochester, New York, where he would witness the challenges of the, uh, of, of the flood of immigrants coming to American shores. Rauschenbusch began his pastorate in the Second German Baptist Church in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Uh, again, Rauschenbusch is known as the father of the social gospel, and his view of Christianity, hear this clearly, his view of Christianity was that its purpose was not salvation for sinners. That was not, that was not the mere goal of, 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 of Christianity in his mind. Instead, Christianity is the savior for society. You, you hear the distinction? For some, they, they, they don't. And, and they're, 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 what's wrong with that? We, we would want Jesus to be the, the, the societal savior. Well, the reality is that Jesus didn't come to save society. Jesus came to save sinners. Scripture is absolutely clear about that. Daryl and I often recite that on the podcast. I, I, Daryl was the first person I actually heard made that connection. As we're talking on the podcast, wait a minute, Jesus didn't, as we're listening to what we're hearing in the culture over and over and over again uh, about this, this, this utopia that is supposed to be ushered in with this ideological framework known as critical theory of social justice, we're saying, wait a minute. And we're watching evangelical pastors in particular parrot this this, this, this kind of idea, and I'll get into it here, uh, here in a bit. We're, we're asking the question, if Jesus came to save society, well, why didn't he just overturn the Roman government and set up a kingdom right there? Wouldn't that have been that social justice Jesus absolutely would have? He, he, would, have, he would have just said, hey, Rome, you got to give it up. Caesar, give it up. You need to give to the have-nots. You have way too much, Right? What does he say? Render to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is his. Walter Rauschenbusch would impact men like Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. Martin Luther King, known as the father of liberation theology. So let me move on because I'll talk about King and, and his role and, and, and all of that here just in, in just a moment. Known as the father of liberation theology, however, Gustavo Gutierrez was a Catholic priest and his version of Marxian liberation theology in South America uh, is something to note. Again, Gustavo Gutierrez, G-U-T-I-E-R-R-E-Z. The man is still alive today. I think he's in, uh, I think he's in, uh, preaching or teaching in, at Notre Dame. Um, so you can, you, can, you can look up him and, and Google him and listen to his, his ideas, be a spouse in any way, shape, or form that you desire. His idea or version of, of this kind of theology was whereby groups were identified as oppressed, the poor, and oppressors, the wealthy. Gutierrez called for the liberation of these groups. His ideological beginnings were initially about better working conditions for the poor. Not a bad idea, right? You should have better working conditions. Absolutely. However, these would eventually extend theologically to the idea that Jesus only identified with the oppressed and became and came to liberate the oppressed not from sin, but from their oppressors. You see the distinction? What Gutierrez and other liberation theologians were doing in the mid and late 60s caught the attention of one James Cone. So here's what I've done. I've, I've, I've exposed you to who, um, who, who uh, Walter Rauschenbusch was, what he did in the early 1900s that laid the, the, the framework uh, and, and, and fanned the flames for this, this sentimentalist idea about um, about the gospel, that it's here to save societies. I've introduced you now to a liberator in Gustavo Gutierrez who's using this idea along with Marxian ideology. It, he's using it from a theological framework to have impact in South America. And that captures the attention of one James Cone here in the United States. Dr. James Cone was a theologian and author. And, and his, uh, at, by his death, April 28th of 2018, Cone had become the Bill and Judith Moyers Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Systematic Theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York. I think we're going to be in New York here in a week. I might, I might you, while you tee up Columbia, I may tee up, okay, I, I, get, I got my work cut out for me. Many people consider Cone, James Cone, C-O-N-E, the father of black liberation theology. There's so much, like, again, this, what I'm sharing with you in brief snippets is an entire talk where, where I unpack who Cone is, and we'll go through some of his ideas here briefly. As you trace critical race theory within modern, modern evangelicalism today, it's crucial to note that James Cone 
uh, and his influence cannot go unnoticed. Cone's influence cannot be unnoticed. The works of Cone are now celebrated and appreciated within some of the most conservative seminaries and Bible colleges today. So here's what's happening. Why is that important? It's important because what's happening is as you, as, as you identify someone who says, you know what, I feel called a call to ministry. Oh, great. Uh, that's wonderful. We're going to send you to get trained. And you send them off to get trained. They're being trained at a school, perhaps, could be, where a lot of the professors have bought off on Conian ideology, Conian theology. And as these young, impressionable minds get into these seminaries, they're infiltrated with this black liberation theology, though it may not be called such in some spaces and places, it is called that with great, you know, with, 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 with fanfare, with, with a sense of pride. Yeah, we, this is what we know and understand. But, but listen, we, we're only using it as an analytical tool. We're only using it from a standpoint of, of, of an ideological framework by which we examine all of the scriptures, not recognizing and realizing that this is nothing to do with, with the Christianity that you or I know of. Let me explain. What I prefer to do, and Daryl and I always do, is we want to go back to the origins of, uh, of, of, of who, who these people are. We want you to hear what they have to say in their own words rather than telling you what we think they meant by what they said. So when I initially introduced introduce audiences to James Cone, I, I love to play a game called Who Said It First? Who Said It First? And in the game, I provide a quote from James Cone, and I do so side by side with the white supremacist organization known as the Ku Klux Klan. I, I, I do this uh, game, and, 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 I, and I usually take out the word white and black from the language. I want you to hear what's being said, and I take out the word white and black and just ask you, who do you think said this particular statement first? Now, in the interest of time, which I told you I'm going to try to get you out as close to lunchtime as I can, uh, I'm going to forego that game, but rather give you these words specifically from James Cone himself. So let me quote to you from James Cone in Black Theology and Black Power. He says this, quote, For white people, God's reconciliation in Christ Jesus means that God made black people a beautiful people. And if they, meaning white people, are going to be in relationship with God, they must enter utilizing their black brothers who are a manifestation of God's presence on earth, end quote. So what we have is salvation on the basis of ethnicity. Salvation on the basis of ethnicity. Ethnicity has now become salvific. I can now know God not through any means that he's provided by and through Christ Jesus, but I can only know God insofar as I'm connected to somebody black who shows me who God actually is. Continuing to quote from Cohn, he says this, quote, The assumption that one can know God without knowing blackness is the basic heresy of the white church. They want God without blackness, Christ without obedience, and love without death. What they fail to realize is that in America, God's revelation on earth has always been black, red, or, other, or, or some other shocking shade, but never white, end quote. James Cohn would write an article entitled Christianity and Black Power, and he writes this, quote, Jesus' death on the cross represented God's boundless solidarity with victims, even unto death. Jesus' resurrection is the good news that there is new life for the poor that is not determined by their poverty, but overcomes it, end quote. Again, black theology and black power uh, originally published in 1969, Cohen writes this, quote, if the gospel, if the gospel is a gospel of, li- of liberation for the oppressed, then Jesus is where the oppressed are and continues his work of liberation there. Jesus is not safely confined in the first century. He is our contemporary, proclaiming release to the captives and rebelling against all who silently accept structures of injustice. I'm going to pause here because what he's, what he's after here is, is, is revolutionary Jesus, right? Jesus has now become a, a, a political, economic, and social justice warrior extraordinaire who's not simply confined to the, to the first century where he laid down his life as a propitiatory act uh, in an effort to absolve us of the wrath of God due each and every one of us, regardless of our ethnicity. Rather, instead, he's come to make some temporal wrongs right. That's what he's actually come to do. Quote, if Jesus is not 
in the ghetto, if he is not where men are living at the brink of existence, but is rather in the easy life of the suburbs, then the gospel is a lie. I'm going to stop the quote there. <laughs> Listening to black liberation theologians, in particular James Cone, and others in their own words, should be sufficient for you to reject the ideology altogether. But what begins to happen is we, we, we have this lens of victimhood by which we examine the scriptures, at least those who hold to critical theory, critical race theory, and are doing it in seminaries. They, they put this, this lens of victimhood on in an effort to, to view these in some kind of a way that they can, they can kind of look at the scriptures like this and come up with what's supposed to be said. It's problematic in every way. What Cohen is arguing is the same thing that Gutierrez and Rauschenbusch argued. They desired a Jesus who came to save society instead of one that saves sinners. They were looking for a quick fix Jesus that delivers them from their temporary outcomes. In John 17, we find Jesus uh, praying to the Father in what's known as the high priestly prayer. In John 17, 14, Jesus prays, I have, give, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they were not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth, your word. It, sanctify them in the truth, that, that, that definitive article. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. What Cone Gutierrez and Rauschenbusch believe is that Jesus came to do precisely the opposite of what he prayed. Right? He, he, he wanted to come and make the world a better place. He wanted to come and, and give them the kingdoms of this world. He wanted to come and make every situation that they lived in right so that they can live more comfortably. Darrell articulated it beautifully. What they're after is br bringing in a new eschaton. Their, their thought process is, 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 this is this is an eschatological, uh, 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 this, is, this is positing a, a new eschatological position, right? This is their own idea of utopia. They want to usher that in, and they're going to do so uh, by using this ideology of guilt, this ideology of victimhood, this segmentation of culture, this separation and division of classes and race and every other idea that they can come up with in an effort to separate and divide for the purpose of creating this antagonistic uh, uh, environment where we fight one another and battle against one another until the structures of culture come down. And the structures of culture that they're directly taking aim at are the Judeo-Christian, is the Judeo-Christian worldview that created much of the structure that we enjoy to this day. As I move in, I want to go to goal number two. Initially, I wanted to show you that the interconnectivity of CRT with, with, uh, with those three things, with the, with the social gospel, uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, with, with the social gospel, let me go back and because and, there was a lot that I would unpacked there. I wanted to show you the interconnectedness, interconnectedness, I'm going to slow down, the interconnectedness of the social gospel of liberation theology and black liberation theology to CRT. Those three things are connected to CRT. They're the underpinnings and foundation of what frames up CRT, and they do so from a theological perspective. That's what's critically important about this section of what I just unpacked for you. What's important for you to understand is that these men have laid the the theological framework upon which the ideology of critical race theory anchors itself. That's dangerous because now they're into your backyard. Now, 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 they're, now, they're, now, now this, this, is a, this is a Genesis 3 situation, right, where Satan comes in and says, did God really say? Prior to that, this was this godless ideology that, that was just kind of floating out there. We could look at it and go, that's, in, that's absurd. But now they've got a theological framework through these men in particular and many, many others to, to be sure. But these particular areas by which to, to examine uh, what, they, what they're doing. My second goal is this, is to contrast and compare the civil rights movement, which had its primary genesis in the black church, with today's current social justice movement. So goal number two, I want to compare and contrast civil rights with social justice. Okay. In his famous speech given on May 18, 1963, and delivered under the shadows of one of the most symbolic American monuments, the Lincoln Memorial, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream 
speech. And in the speech, Dr. King would explain the grievances of Negro life in great detail, as he and so many others had actually experienced it during the days of Jim Crow and segregation. At every point, I want to pause and unpack this for you because what's happened, what was happening at the time that King delivered his speech were actual injustices, were actual real uh, life circumstances that you could point to and you could see a separate drinking, uh, a separate you know, uh, water fountain where, where, where the, the name white and colored was there. You could see the, the separate but so-called equal conditions that men and women, black and otherwise, were living in at the time. Today, it's just a, you know, I, I feel an injustice or, I, or there's, there's this mist of, of, of an idea around racism that, that I think is in the ether. In fact, Daryl quoted it well with the, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, critical theorist who said, you know what, racism doesn't even need to be there for it to be evident in the institution. There doesn't need to be a, a personal racist in that space for racism to exist. Quite different, again, in contrast from King's world in which he lived in at the time that he delivered this speech. It would be the platform that I mentioned at the Lincoln Memorial where Dr. King would, would, use, uh, would use this opportunity to call America to the height and beauty of the Judeo-Christian ideals that permeate the nation's founding documents. King said this, quote, In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise to all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end quote. King would go on to say this, quote, We refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash a check. A check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice, end quote. King would appeal to the equality of all humanity in the most famous portion of his speech when he said this, quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, end quote. I, I pause here to let that sink in as everything opposite of that is what's being said and expressed in our culture today. We're needed to be judged by the color of our skin, and, and the content of our characters is not to be questioned, and if you dare question it, you're the racist. While many theologians struggle, and rightfully so, with Dr. King's theology. There's all kinds of questions about Dr. King's theology, and, and, and they're right questions. They need to be looked at and exposed, but under the framework of common grace, I believe that there's some things that King actually gets right. Let me outline three of those uh, uh, spe specifically with, with regard to that. Number one, he appealed to the Judeo-Christian founding of the United States. He appealed to the Judeo-Christian founding of the United States. And, and, and identified it in the founding documents, the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence. At the time of the speech, number two, what King did was he, did, he made an appeal to the equality of opportunity rather than to the equity of outcome. That's critically important. So the first thing that he did was he appealed to the Judeo-Christian founding of our culture through its founding documents. The second thing he did was he appealed to the equality of opportunity rather than the equity of outcome. This could be identified in the language of freedom, liberty, and justice for all. And thirdly, while he missed issues regarding the Trinitarian nature of God, he delivered an appeal to the Imago Dei in all of humanity. He appealed to the Imago Dei in all of humanity. This could constant, constantly be heard in the language of equality for people of every ethnic background, black men and white men, Jews, Gentiles, Protestants, Catholics. Every segmented area based upon some label was all couched under the umbrella of all of us are image bearers of God des deserving of equal dignity, value, and worth. Long after Dr. King's assassination on April 4th of 1968, historians would agree that this speech, the I Have a Dream speech, delivered to more than 250,000 people in the shadows of the Lincoln Memorial would be the, the high point of the civil rights movement. 
King's constant reminder to all was, was one of nonviolence, right? He would say this, quote, We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to denigrate into physical violence. His call was that, that their movement not denigrate to physical violence. What do we see in our current modern day movement? Before I uh, unpack that, let me continue with a quote from King. He said this, quote, listen to this closely. He says this, quote, the nonviolent resistor not only avoids external physical violence, but he avoids internal violence of spirit. He not only refuses to shoot his opponent, but he refuses to hate him. And he always stands with understanding and goodwill, end quote. How does, how does that compare to what you're seeing uh, in the news on a daily basis with different commentators advocating the, the, the modern day social justice positions? Now here we are 53 some odd years later after King's historic speech as we examine the landscape of culture, we have the modern day social justice movement. So let me unpack for you a little bit about the social justice movement. It's by, uh, b had been advanced by three women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Calors, and Opal Tometi. These are the three women who lead the charge for Black Lives Matter. This new approach to social justice began with the jury verdict in the case of Trayvon Martin, the Trayvon Martin case. On July 13th, 2013, after hearing all of the evidence in the Trayvon Martin case, the six women jury, which included one minority, as if intersectional points matter in this instance, I guess we'll, we'll account for the, the women and the minorities as a result rather than, rather than the clarity of, of the uh, truthfulness of the evidence. This verdict was delivered, the verdict of not guilty was delivered despite being given at the last minute the option of three choices. So here they were, the Trayvon Martin case, George Zimmerman has, has, has been found not guilty, but prior to the, the jury deliberating on the case, they were given an additional option. They were gi given second degree murder or find him uh, guilty of a lesser charge of manslaughter or find him not guilty. Now this is what began the, the uh, modern day BLM movement. I could unpack the specifics of the case and the trajectory of the bullet and how we know that, that George Zimmerman was actually on the ground about to get his head bashed in when the actual gun shot and all the witness testimony I could unpack. I've, I've read all of the documents validating all of the issues related to that. We could do that. I don't have time to do that. I simply have to mention it here and say this. This, this is what began the modern day Black Lives Matter movement. Next in line to follow that decision was the Michael Brown case. Prior to the investigation of the Brown case, we had the hands up, don't shoot narrative. You all might remember if you looked at the nightly news that night, everybody was, was doing this. You had NFL football players walking out onto the football field do, doing this symbol as if to identify with the issues that, that took place with the Michael Brown, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Michael Brown issue, uh, his, his tragic uh, loss of life. And uh, they, were, they were trying to say that, that you know, black men just walk around and just for the mere fact that they're black, even when they have their hands up and they're screaming, hands up, don't shoot, that, uh, that they're being shot at by white officers. That was the narrative that was played nightly uh, for those who uh, were, were watching. It swept the country. That narrative swept the country. Everyone from entertainers to athletes all were promoting this narrative. Michael Brown's case, however, would actually be investigated by the Obama administration's Department of Justice head, Eric Holder. In the case of Michael Brown, Obama's DOJ could not find enough evidence to even charge the officers of wrongdoing in the Michael Brown shooting. So let me be clear about what we have here. We had a black president, a black attorney general, a black district attorney who could not find the hands up, don't shoot narrative to be accurate nor was there even sufficient evidence to prosecute the officers involved in the death of Michael Brown. After a seven-month investigation, attorney Eric Holder said the following in a statement, quote, this morning the Justice Department announced its conclusion of our investigation and has released a comprehensive 87-page report documenting our findings. And, and uh, documenting our findings and conclude that the facts do not support the filing of criminal charges against Officer Darden Wilson in, in this case. Michael Brown's death, though a tragedy, did not involve prosecutable, uh, pro prosecutable conduct on the part of Officer Wilson. Now, the Michael Brown case notwithstanding, the high point of the Black Lives Matter movement has been the case of George Floyd. I could walk you through this case with great depth um, and ask a lot of questions. I don't 
have time. If we're going to get out of here by lunch, I've got a lot of hurrying to do. So let me continue on by saying this. Before the, the, the adjudication of Officer Derek Chauvin in the, killing, in the killing of George Floyd, protests seeking justice for Floyd had spread to over 2,000 cities and over 50 states to include more than 60 countries. While some were peaceful, according to the media, it was staggering to consider the number of innocent victims who have been killed and the inestimable cost of repair to damaged cities and businesses forever lost in black communities and elsewhere. Numerous contrasts can be made to examine this modern-day social movement and the civil rights movement. However, I want to reiterate the three components that I appealed to earlier. The civil rights movement of the 60s appealed to three things. One, the Judeo-Christian founding of the United States. Two, the equality, uh, to equality rather than equity. And three, the image of God in all of us. That was the civil rights movement. The current modern-day uh, BLM movement, however, has a different narrative, and there's are as follows. One, American culture at its founding was based upon the sin of slavery. American culture at its founding was based upon the sin of slavery. Number two, all inequity is the result of systemic racism. Darrell laid it out very well when, when he talked about the, the, the inequity and, and, and differences and, and disparities and what, what those, and, and unpack the definitions for all of those. And it's important to note that that in the, the ideological framework that undergirds the, the modern-day BLM social justice movement, all in inequity, all inequality is the result of systemic racism. And I use those words interchangeably because they do, right? Equity and equality, uh, it, used to, it used to be, okay, it, it, equality simply means we're all equal, right? Equity means we're looking for outcome. But here's what's happened. Those, th those two uh, words have been reversed in their usage, uh, and, and so, again, the, the whole social justice movement is, is one of deconstruction. It is the deconstruction of language. So just when you think you have a hold on, on a particular word or its meaning, it will change and shift. I love what, what Daryl said in his talk when he said uh, that, that, that this, is, this movement is, is stealthy in nature. It's purposed to be hidden. And sometimes they hide things in plain sight by an overuse of language in their explanations the long and lengthy definitions for particular words. Why? It's written not for the common person, but for the academician. One, to impress each other with the words they know. And two, to be unclear to you and I so that we lack understanding of what they're even trying to say at the end of the day. I could, go, I could say more, but I'll continue. Uh, I'll stick with my notes. For those who might think I'm overstating the case, allow me to quote to you from the Black Lives Matter website. Daryl mentioned before, we, we, we quote from the sources themselves. They say this, quote, Black Lives Matter was founded in 2013 in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer. Black Lives Matter Foundation, Inc., whose mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence and violence inflicted on black communities by state and vigilantes by combating and countering acts of violence and creating space for black imagination and innovation and centering black joy we are winning immediate improvements in our lives now listen i'm not a uh, a, a, a writing scholar by any stretch but anyone who's listening to that that sentence written knows that there could be a whole lot more clarity in that. Uh, just, you, you, half of it, you, it's not even clear what they even mean. These two contrasting approaches cannot be more evident. And as Christians, we've got to be careful about attaching ourselves to this current movement. It should be clear that, that it is founded upon anti-Christian positions. Now, having presented the contrast between the civil rights movement and the modern social justice movement, I want to move on to my final goal. Goal number three is to explain how these movements entered into evangelicalism. If you'll allow me, this probably will take me about 15 minutes to unpack. So I just want you to know uh, that's where we are. I know I'm at high noon. I'm going to take, take about 15 minutes. And I know you got, yeah, yeah, yeah. My man's got his, watch, his stopwatch on me. Now, some would argue that the match that ignited the flame of CRT within evangelicalism actually took place or happened on May 25th, 2020. And that was the day that George Floyd was tragically killed. I would argue that the slow death of biblical sufficiency tragically happened long before. 
what paved the way for CRT within evangelicalism are two things. One is pragmatism, and two is sentimentalism. Pragmatism is the idea that whatever works must be right and true. Why? Well, because it works. Sentimentalism says whatever feels right must be right and true. And in 2020, as city blocks burned after the death of George Floyd, cultural sentimentalism was on full display. The sentimentalists ignored the business owner whose business had burned <coughs> and instead sided with the violent perpetrator's actions as they were seen as giving voice to the voiceless. The problem with, the, with sentimentalism is that it begins when rational thinking is abandoned in favor of one's feelings. Unfortunately, our current class warfare of oppressed versus oppressor groups actually exacerbates the problem. One of the problems with, with the idea of, of sentimentalism and, 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 it, and its approach is, is it, it, its anchor is emotion, and its standard of truth is how I feel. So if in the morning I feel like a six-foot-tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman, that's what I am. I'm going to let that settle in for you for a minute. <clears throat> let the imagery kick in, right? If, if, but if I feel that way, who are you to say differently? And if I've got a, if I've got a sad enough storyline of, of abuse in my past and of something that happened to me that was tragic, well, you should feel empathy and not challenge objective truth that stares you in the face that says I'm a five foot six beautiful brown bald brother. <laughs> you should ignore that for what I feel today because what I feel must be validated. And if you challenge it, well then you're the racist, you're the bigot, you're the homophobe, you're the one who, who's, who's transphobic. That's what we're seeing as the height of this new religion of sentimentalism in our culture. And, and that's what we're up against. Sadly, what we witnessed, though, over the course of time is that this has begun to invade the church. I say this, one of the problems created with the anesthetic of sentimentalism is that it abandons sola scriptura. You know what that is, right? Scripture alone. It abandons this for sola sentimentalismi. I've abandoned sola scriptura for sentimentalism alone. Those seeking so-called analytical tools like critical race theory actually thrive in an environment where we've abandoned scripture and embraced sentimentalism. They thrive in that environment. Why? Well, because it feels good to believe that what's required to address the sin of racism today is special knowledge. You see, I'm, I'm woke. I've got special knowledge you don't have. Now, either you get converted and get woke and understand and uh, uh, reject your, your, your whiteness and and, and repent of, of, of the sin of whiteness and uh, learn how to be less white or else you, you're, not, you're not a part of this new religion. It, 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 the idea is that there's, the, there's this new ethnic Gnosticism, there's this new ethnic knowledge or ethnic Gnosticism that needs to be embraced. Dr. Vodi Bakum actually coined the term ethnic Gnosticism. The idea that, that there's a special knowledge that I have based upon my experiences be, that, that, are, that are unique to my ethnicity. That, that are unique to the color of my skin. Well, all of us have unique experiences. Each and every one of us, regardless of the color of our skin. Sentimentalism and pragmatism, the pragmatism that precedes it, actually gives us a view of self that is far too high and a view of scripture that is far too low. So we amplify us and we minimize what scripture has to say about us. The creator of the universe who, who, who gives us the scripture, gives us the revelation of who he is through the scripture is absolutely ignored when he's the one who created us. And our idea of who we are begins to take the forefront. That's absolutely problematic. What it does is it replaces the holiness of God with the hollowness of self. It minimizes sin, it maximizes partiality, and it deconstructs all the boundaries initiated by God in the scripture. Now, before the invasion of CRT into the bloodstream of church culture, heavy doses of this anesthetic called sentimentalism had to be applied so that the pain of CRT could become innocuous to the follower of Christ. 
Well, where did sentimentalism come into the church? I told you about it with Walter Rauschenbusch in the early, 19, in the early 1900s. Sentimentalism was on display. Why? There were these, these people who were coming in boats and they had a difficult time and they didn't have any money. What was happening within the culture? Sentimentalism had invaded and we adopted that idea. And it began to flourish and permeate throughout culture over the course of time. Long before George Floyd, evangelicalism had been experiencing the dulling impact of sentimentality or sentimentalism. It opened the door to the seeker-sensitive movement, the emergent church movements, and encouraged the embrace of cultural relevance, of pop culture pragmatism, and social justice that kicked down the doors of our churches. <clears throat> Sadly, Christians and church leaders have exchanged being salt and light for being civil and liked. As I mentioned earlier, pragmatism is the approach that says if it works, it must be right. And sadly, far too many have, be, have be begun to believe this idea as truth. And they began using strategies that attracted bodies instead of believers. In light of this, no one should have been surprised when on Sunday, the very Sunday after the death of George Floyd, to witness pastors breathlessly racing into their pulpits, almost tripping over their skirts to get into the pulpit to declare that black lives mattered. On May 30th, five days later, before all the circumstances surrounding George Floyd's death were clear, specifically what motivated Derek Chauvin in the act, Southern Baptist Church leadership had connected the dots for those who had any question. And they, and they read about it and they stated it this way, quote, as a convention of churches committed to the equality and dignity of all people, Southern Baptists grieved the death of George Floyd, who was killed May 25, 2020, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. While all must grieve, we must understand that in our hearts, in the hearts of our fellow citizens of color, incidents like these connect to a long history of unequal justice in our country, going back to grievous, the grievous days of Jim Crow and the slavery eras, end quote. I want that to settle in what you just heard, because for the most part, if you hear that just in, in, in common day, you go, yeah, that's really nice. Why? It appeals to the sentimentalism that resides on the inside of your heart. Yeah. Our citizens of color should, yeah, they probably, yeah. If that's what you are saying when you hear that statement, you've bought into sentimentalism. You've absolutely drank it down like water. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. The first part of the statement is correct. As a people committed to the equality and dignity of all people, we should all grieve the death of George Floyd. We should grieve anyone's death. In fact, death should grieve us all because we are aware that as a result of sin, we all experience death. That should be grieving to us all. However, any grief on the subjective basis of one's skin color, especially those who call themselves believers in Christ, should be closely examined rather than made as an excuse. It's problematic to suggest that people of color are an ideological monolith. I mean, this is a whole other aspect. What does the statement do? The statement says that if you're a person of color, well, all of us are people of color, whether you believe that or not. The reality is all of you, white, black, red, brown, we're all people of color. We got some color. All of us have melanin. But as a person of color, what it paints is this idea that all of us are a monolith, that all of us felt the same thing. Well, how would you know that? I didn't get a call. Daryl, did you get a call? Nobody called you? Chad, did you get a call? Nobody called you? Chris, you get a call? Nobody called you? Okay, well, how would they know that people of color felt a specific way? Add to this the idea that people without a certain amount of melanin are, are absent of such knowledge. In other words, if you don't have a certain level of melanin, there's there's a level of empathy and sadness you can't really feel. Are you, are you not seeing how crazy this is? 
if this is true, if, 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 if that idea is accurate, then what we have is ethnic Gnosticism, what Vody talked about a decade ago. Again, I, I, I'm uncertain how the, how the, as I think about the incident with George Floyd, I have no idea how it is connected to slavery and Jim Crow apart from someone telling me that it is and me buying off on what they just posited. What I saw were two men, image bearers of God, in an incident of, of, of absolute sin. Sin caused the, the police officer to be there. The police officer, I love what Daryl and I talk about often, just because someone wears a, wears a badge and a uniform doesn't mean that they're absent sin. His actions were sinful. They didn't take into account the fact that, they, that he had his knee on another image bearer of God. That, that, that we're going to look at an incident and automatically a, a, attach motivation. That's the ism that Daryl talked about earlier. Now, now what I'm saying is I can peer into your heart and know exactly what you're thinking and feeling. Upon what basis it's irrelevant. Just because of the level of melanin in your skin, I, I know what you're thinking. So that's, that's mind reading on a, on, a, on a level that's just unbelievable. I may stick with my notes. After this statement, the statement that I just read you from, uh, from Southern, Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention president at the time. You can go look it up. I'll leave it at that. After this statement, there were numerous Facebook posts, blog articles, and podcasts, and even sermons that spent time explaining the plight of the black man and the need for whites to repent of whiteness. Evangelicalism, following cultural cues, adopted the narrative of black victimhood and oppression and began calling for racial reconciliation. Now allow me to be absolutely clear. We who believe in Christ, we who are the followers of Christ, are already reconciled through the finished work of Christ. We're reconciled both to God the Father and to one another. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 22 explicitly make that clear. Daryl is going to unpack that here this afternoon when he talks about the issue of it's not ethnicity, it's enmity. You don't want to miss that. And then tomorrow, if you're here, a member of this church, I'm going to really unpack Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 in a greater way, just an expositional kind of framework that will really be helpful. I, I want you to take the sermon, put it in your hip pocket, and take it with you when, you when you go out to talk to friends and neighbors during the holiday. Rather than seeking revelation through the whole counsel of God's word, many churches sought revelation, so, I'm sorry, many churches sought relevance and adopted the language of the culture on these particular issues. Far too many pastors were racing to be the first to step into their pulpit, like I mentioned, tripping over their, their skirts to do so in order to feel connected to a hashtag movement before, before actually studying its origins. Bible study groups were no longer assigned the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And instead, they were given D'Angelo and Tisby and Kendi and Morrison's writings. Church leaders often advise followers to seek discussions on race, to abandon whiteness, to check their privilege, and to understand the cultural issues through a uniquely ethnic lens. As it pertains to this cultural moment, our circumstances don't require new programs or policies. They require believers in Christ to know their Bibles. This cultural moment requires us to go back to the historic roots that, that we are a part of. Our historic roots where people were willing to stand up and, and even be willing to die for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to go back to those roots. Even today, as we look at the landscape of culture, there are people who are being imprisoned for simply keeping their church doors open. And as we watch those kinds of examples, it's in this area particularly that we need to be strong. We need to take a stand. We need to be willing to, to deal with being called names and called this and called that. Scripture tells us with, with crystal clarity, Jesus himself says, you'll be in the world. The world won't love you as its own. Why? Because you're not of the world. So, so the expectation that we're going to somehow have the right kind of lingo and language and, and adopt maybe some of the CRT that might work and some of it that don't, we, we'll take the baby and not the bathwater, that's garbage. Long before CRT, the Bible was clear on the issue of ethnicity. 
Pastors should remember that all sins are sensitive to the person who desires to stay in their sin. I don't think you heard me. (laughs) Pastors need to understand that all sins are sensitive, especially to the person who desires to stay in their sin. So when you have to confront these issues, when you see them in your church, don't be so wishy-washy, milk toast that you're not willing to, that's sinful. And what that is is racism. Stop calling it reverse racism. It's just racism, right? In fact, abandon racism. Go back to biblical language. That's, that's hatred. Why do you hate your brother? Repent of that. Pastors should remember again that, that the words of, of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says this, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God which you've heard from, from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it was, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Allow God's word to confront these matters. I'll close with 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 6, which say this. But understand this. Here's the reminder. That in the last days there will come difficult times where people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen. You think think Paul would get tired of writing this to Timothy, but he keeps on. With conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. And the encouragement, last scripture, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, by his appearing kingdom, preach the word. Men of God, women of God, share the message of the gospel. It is the light of the gospel that is the hope of the world. Christ came to save sinners, not societies. So it's your responsibility. As much as you're angst-filled about what you see in culture, start with the conversation with the person next to you and share with them the message of the gospel. Now understand that it is the power of God. Understand.